today we're going to talk about the son of King Sennacherib, King Sanchiru, Sarhaddun, whose name in ancient Assyrian is Ashur Acha Adina. Ashur, the god, has given a brother or given us a brother. So Sarhaddun uh, is a king that, um, like many of the Neo-Assyrian kings, is a very interesting character. All of the Assyrian kings in the Neo period are interesting. Why? Because we have so much documentation about many of these kings. And Sarhaddun is one we also have very interesting documentation about. Today we're going to focus on several aspects of Sarhaddun's life. We're going to understand the trauma that Sarhaddun underwent early in life. And we're going to talk about. Um, what that trauma did to him, how he, like many of us who have difficult lives, rose to the challenge and continued on the path of doing what he had to do. We're going to talk about his illness, uh, physical and psychological illness, uh, as, as revealed to us through various texts, um, which include the writings of doctors uh, Essieh, at the time of King Sarhaddun. We're going to talk about how his fears materialized into concrete form to create something called the Edde or the contract, which is sort of emulated in the Deuteronomy. Um, if you understand the chapter of Deuteronomy in the Bible and you see how stylistically is um, Deuteronomy written, you will see many of the uh, aspects of the Edde, and it's different when talking about, for example, God and King, but stylistically, many uh, scholars, biblical scholars say the uh, chapter in Deuteronomy uh, comes from, stylistically, comes from the uh, Edde, or the, the uh, loyalty oath of Sarhaddun. Sometimes it's called a vassal treaty. And I'll get into that just a little bit, um, but not, not too much because we have a lot to go over. Finally, we're going to talk about the death and legacy of King Sarhaddun. So when King Sarhaddun comes to power, what is Assyria like? Let's kind of take a big picture view of what Assyria was like. There were 700 years of stability in Assyria, something like 700 years prior to the arrival of uh, King Sanchiru, who you see here. This is one of my favorite artistic creations of the ancient Assyrians. And it tells us so much about the style of and the procedure of handing power from father to son. And of course, it didn't always have to be father to son, it could have been somebody else from the royal family, but really keeping it in the family, as it were. And, and the way the Assyrians portrayed King the father, here you see Sargon II on the right, and then you see Sennacherib, <clears throat> his son, to the left. And they're looking eye to eye. They're pretty much equal, uh, minus the staff being held by King Sargon II and the uh, tiara, the, the hat worn by the king, which is in typical Assyrian fashion. And of course, the crown prince, which um, Sennacherib is, always has a, um, the band, and it has two flowing ribbons from it. This is typical of the dress of a crown prince in Assyrian history. So we have a long line of continuous kings, really one of the longest, as many scholars say, in the history of mankind, the longest dynasty. Got to remember, you know, the, the Achaemenid Persians ruled for about 300 years. The, the um, Babylonians ruled for, Neo-Babylonians ruled for about 70 some years. The uh, Medes ruled for a shorter period than that. Uh, so many other uh, empires ruled for a much shorter time. Certainly in the history of Mesopotamia, we have nothing like the long line of Assyrian kings. So oftentimes you hear 
uh, someone remarking, for example, that, well, because of their cruelty, the Assyrians kind of came and went very fast. Well, it wasn't very fast. They ruled for about a thousand years as a major regional power. And this, this kingdom, this, this kingship stayed within largely one family or kind of set of families within Assyria for centuries. So in the seventh century BC, Assyria was already an ancient kingdom. So Assyrian kings could look back centuries uh, back actually thousands of years back to their history and recognize that they have come a long way. It was by far at this time the largest Near Eastern Empire and encompassed large areas of, of uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Israel, and then of course the Assyrians will go into uh, Egypt. Assyria was divided, or the Assyrian Empire, I should say, was divided into about 70 provinces, each under a control of a governor appointed by the king and answering to the king and his vizier, or viziers, the people around him, his staff, and so on. And uh, many of these uh, governors tended to be eunuchs. A eunuch is uh, a person who is castrated. And uh, he is castrated because his family, either royal or otherwise, um, commits him to the service of the kingdom and the priesthood, and he serves the king. So um, two advantages, of course, uh, a eunuch sole focus is taking care of business, the empire, and of course, a eunuch cannot have children. And so there's no threat that someone will take over and um, who's a eunuch take over and uh, and uh, take over the kingdom or or pose a threat to the king. So many of the governors tended to be um, uh, eunuchs, the governors. Now, as I said, there was there was a difference between vassal states and and uh, states of the Assyrian Empire, provinces of the Assyrian Empire ruled by such eunuchs. And the difference is that vassals were allowed to be almost kind of an autonomous uh, uh, setup, an autonomous uh, kingdom, but under the protection or protectorate of the Assyrian Empire. And of course, in return for the protection given to them by the Assyrian Empire, the, uh, the vassal states would have to pay tribute. And oftentimes, as we will see in this lecture, when uh, empires clashed when you had a, a balance of power situation and um, the balance of power was tipping this way or that that way, vassal states would often try to get rid of their um, vassaldom, their tribute, their taxes and so on and get a better deal going somewhere else. So this is the situation that eventually we will see today between Egypt and Assyria. And we saw this before a little bit during the time of King Sennacherib, the father of King Sennacherib. The average Assyrian did not know where the king was at any particular time. But the Assyrian king, of course, had all kinds of symbols of power that the average Assyrian citizen could see. What were these symbols of power? Of course, the palace. Uh, the steles that were set up, the sculptures, incredible sculptures, and so on. Uh, now, at any one time, there could be a ritual in a uh, temple. So the symbols of power radiating from the king and his administration was felt by the Assyrians, although the king himself, the average Assyrian, did not know where he was at any particular time. Remember, there was no internet at that time. Sources of communication were very difficult and the average person couldn't read. The loyalty oath was a very important uh, part of the structure of the Assyrian Empire. Every Assyrian inhabitant um, was personally tied to the king by the means of this momita, or mamitu, in, um, which is a loyalty oath, imposed at the time of the new king's ascension to the throne and repeated at important events such as election of a crown prince, at times even um, various uh, uh, various uh, rituals, as in temples. 
the oath was perceived as a spiritual essence, and the oath-taking ceremony included the ritual drinking of water and the use of oil as well, which was thought to cause the oath itself to enter the body. This was meant to prevent from within any breach of the agreement or the breach of the momita or manitu. And of course, um, not to analogize too much, but, but we also as Christians, when we take um, what is called korbana or communion, um, we, we feel that we internalize our faith. So in a way, it was very similar, the drinking of water or the use of oils in the past to kind of internalize an oath that is given by uh, repeating certain words and by thinking certain thoughts. So as we said, the dynasty of Assyrian kings was among the longest in the world, according to Karen Radner, a combination of a decentralized administration, meaning the governors, and close personal link between the people and their king was the backbone of the Assyrian Empire, which since the 14th century had been a, a constant in the ever-changing political geography of the ancient Near East. As various kingdoms fell and others rose, the Assyrian kingdom was there. For seven centuries, this way of government succeeded, always headed by a member of the same family. This clan had ruled the ancient city of Ashur many centuries prior to its mutation into a center of a territorial empire, and therefore the dynasty of the Assyrian kings um, is to be counted among the longest living in world history. So um, again, kind of a counter to those who say, well, the Assyrians came and went because they were very cruel, you know, their kingdom didn't last. No, the Assyrian kingdom lasted a much longer time than, uh, for example, the rule of the Persian Achaemenids, which, um, you know, again, many people equate with the Sasanians and the Parthians, and, and we're going to go over that to understand that these were different kingdoms. They weren't the same. Who could be king? Stability of such kingship remained in one family's control for more than a millennium. Going back over the Assyrian kings list, which we studied earlier, it did not need to pass from father to son or even the eldest son. Each of the king's male relatives was a possible successor to the throne of Assyria. And uh, some kings had you know, multiple uh, sons. Uh, for example, Sanhedrin had 18, 18 uh, or 18 children, excuse me many sons. Hence, the royal bloodline was well protected against its extinction. And so all the king's sons, brothers, cousins, nephews, um, and remember, King Sargon II was the brother of Shalmansar V, who took over, not his son. And, and for that reason, sometimes people think King Sargon II is a usurper. He was not. He was the brother of uh, Shalmansar V. And uh, the son of uh, Tikla Poleza III, but also more distant relatives could ascend to the Assyrian throne. So everyone, as long as they're in the royal family, they could have a shot at the, at the uh, crown. In order to be king, though, a candidate needed to enjoy perfect physical and mental health. Keep this in mind as we talk about Sarhedda. It was, however, the king's exclusive privilege to choose an heir during his reign and with divine assistance. And um, there's also one more thing here uh, where the king was influenced by, and that is his wife or wives uh, or his queen or others within his circle. So in addition to having a, the prerogative of choosing an heir, the king also had a, a wife or a queen to please. And also in addition to that, of course, um, there is divine intervention, according to many of the uh, records that are kept and read. Sennacherib had more than 11 sons, but chose his eldest, Ashur Nadim Shumi, to take the throne. Now, he's the oldest of um, Sennacherib's children, and he is sent to Babylon. He is sent to Babylon to rule, but unfortunately, he is kidnapped while in Babylon. Uh, being betrayed by certain members of uh, the Babylonian uh, uh, elites, and he is turned over to the Elamites and disappears, never is heard from again. It is assumed that he is murdered. 
The next person in line becomes a, a crown prince, and that is Urdu Mulisi. He is next in line and becomes crown prince, and actually is crown prince for over a decade. But Sennacherib chooses Sarhadun Ashur Achadina, son of Naqiya or Zakutu. Naqiya Zakutu is often uh, thought to be her legacy. It's thought to be thought to have blended within the legacy of King Samuramat <clears throat> or Queen Shamiram or Samiramis because of her role in being very influential in the Assyrian kingdom. She is the wife of King Sennacherib, uh, his, his second wife, official wife. She is the mother of King Sarheddin, and she is the grandmother of King Ashurbanipal. And she plays a role in particular in the life of her son Sarheddin and also in the life of her son Ashurbanipal, as we will discuss in the next class. So, um, Sarheddin, Ashur had been given a brother, or Ashur has, uh, Ashur, excuse me, has given a brother, uh, rules from 681 <clears throat> BC to 669 BC. As we said, he's the youngest king of, uh, the youngest son of King Sennacherib. His mother was Zakutu, also known as Naqiya Zakutu at times, who is thought to be um, uh, of either Western stock. Some people think that she may have been a member of a Judean family. Uh, some people speculate that she is um, a member of uh, the Aramaic, uh, an Aramean uh, a tribal group. And some people think that she came from uh, Babylon. Um, now, Sanhedun was confronted with, with various challenges at least twice in his life. The first time was with Urdu Mulisi, uh, who is his brother, his older brother, and the second time with a man named Sasi. Who is Sasi? We will find out very quickly. Sanhedun becomes king in the year 681. Sennacherib had made him crown prince just two years earlier. Remember, this is a little bit of a problem. Um, well, it's a big problem, actually. Why? Because <clears throat> he was chosen as an heir against all odds because uh, uh, Sennacherib had originally chosen Urdu Murisi, who had acted as a, a crown prince for over a decade, for something like 12 years. And uh, we don't know the reason Sennacherib changed his mind about who was supposed to take over after him, but there is speculation among scholars that Naqiya, uh, his wife, Naqiya Zakutu, played a very prominent role because Urdu Mulisi was not her son. He was Sennacherib's uh, previous wife's uh, son, a uh, first wife's son, <coughs> excuse me, and he had really. Um, gathered a lot of people around him, and this is going to cause a problem because all of those people who supported him, because he was considered to be the rightful heir to King Sennacherib, um, were stunned to find out kind of at the last minute or two years uh, um, before Sennacherib's death that uh, he is made crown prince. And what does Sarhaddin tell us about this? My father who begat me exalted me in all due right and with all my brothers, amid all my brothers. And thus he spoke, is this the son of my succession? Asking Shemesh and Edith, again by oracle, by divine, asking for divine intervention and divine guidance. By, and Shemesh and Edith by oracle and with a true affirmative, uh, they answered him thus. He is thy second self, meaning he is worthy as you are. Their solemn utterance he respected, and the people of Assyria, small and great, my brothers, of the name of my father's house, together he assembled before Asher, who is the head of the Assyrian pantheon, seen Shemesh Nebu Marduk, the gods of Assyria, the gods dwelling in heaven and on earth, with regard to the securing of my legitimate succession he made them repeat their solemn utterance. Solemn utterance, momita, meaning everyone swore to allow Sarhaddin to come to power. 
But this was not to be. Why? Because um, Sarhaddun uh, found out that his father was murdered by his son, Urdu Mulisi. And although he had sworn a uh, loyalty oath, a momita or manitu, to his brother, his younger brother, he opposed uh, the elevation of Sarhaddun to uh, kingship and he conspired against him and he tried unsuccessfully to get to King Sennacherib to uh, change his mind, but he was not able. One would speculate again at this time that Naqiya Zakutu had a lot to do with um, uh, Sennacherib not changing his mind. Sennacherib does not seem not changing, meaning not reverting back to accepting Urdu Mulisi after he had accepted Sarhaddun. Uh, but he did not realize, uh, Sennacherib did not realize how dangerous the situation was and that Urdu Mulisi, his son, may have been harboring, harboring a very violent temper towards his father. And he was completely caught off guard when uh, he and uh, his brother, Urdu Mulisi, and a brother apparently assassinated um, King uh, Sennacherib on the 20th day of October in 681 BC. And we have uh, references to this assassination in the Bible, um, in the Old Testament, and of course, um, it is mentioned that King Sennacherib was worshipping at the time that he was slain. Uh, but of course, the details around it are kind of mixed up. We don't have the exact uh, reference to where he was praying. Um, but we do know that his brothers, or, or the brothers of Sarhaddun, who were unhappy with Sennacherib's selection of Sarhaddun, the younger son, um, had uh, brought an end to their father. Now, they were not able to enjoy their, um, their attempted coup because um, the people of Assyria, along with uh, Sarhaddun, as we see, will eventually turn against them. Sarhaddun communed in his heart. I communed in my heart and pondered in my soul thus. And, and this is the wonderful part about the history of the Neo-Assyrian kings is they wrote so much, so we're able to kind of read. We know more about the ancient Assyrians, for example, than we know a lot of times about the Normans and, and uh, other peoples who came much later, Germanic tribes in Europe and so on. We know much more about the Assyrians because of the volume of literature contained in Assyrian history and Assyrian records is just incredible. Their works, according to Sarhaddin, are they violent? And due to their own wit, do they trust? And is it evil against the gods that they will do? He's asking. Asha, the merciful king of the gods and Marduk, to whom inequity is an abomination. With supplication, lamentation, and prostration, I implored them, and they accepted my prayers. According to the wisdom of the great gods, my lords, in the face of evil doings, they let me dwell in a secret place, in a secret place, their uh, kindly ages over me, they spread and safeguarded me for, um, for the royalty. King Sarhaddun was hidden during this time because uh, Sennacherib aided him and as did Naqiya, and they made sure that he was protected, the young uh, prince, because there was danger from his brothers. Thereafter, my brothers went mad. And whatever was wicked against the gods and men, they did, and plotted evil. They drew the sword in the midst of Nineveh godlessly, meaning they stirred revolution, rebellion. To exercise the kinship against each other, they rushed like young steers, meaning they were so overexcited about trying to take over that they rushed like young steers, he says. And of course, uh, battle results. There's a, a minor civil war within Assyria. Assyria falls into chaos during this time. And this is what Sarhaddin tells us. Ashur, Sin, Shemesh, Ben, Nabu, Ishtar of Nineveh, Ishtar of Erbel. He is very religious. The doings of the scoundrels, meaning his brothers, which had been wrought against the will of the gods, 
meaning the momita that everyone had given, the, the loyalty oath that everyone had taken, swearing by the gods, his brothers go against it. A saw with displeasure and help them not. They brought their strength to weakness and humbled them before me. The people of Assyria, who the covenant by the oath of the great gods had sworn with water and oil to guard my royalty, went not to their aid. In other words, although some people did support Udumunisi, by and large, the larger majority of Assyrians did not support them. I said, Heddam, who by the help of the great gods, his lords, hath not turned his back in the midst of battle, meaning on courageous, soon heard of their wicked doings and crying, Woe, rent my princely robe and uttered lamentation. Obviously, he's very sad with the situation. He has to fight his brothers. Like a lion, I roared and my spirit was stirred. To carry on the royal rule of my father's house, I clapped my hands to Ashur, Sin, Shemesh, Bel, Nabu, and Nirgal, Ishtar of Nineveh, Ishtar of Arbella. I raised my hands and they received my prayer with favor. With their true yea, they sent a helpful oracle thus. Go, stay not. We will march at thy side and destroy thine enemies, your enemies. So Sadhaddun goes from west where, where he is kind of hidden, uh, possibly in Haran. The speculation is we will go back to Haran. Um, there's a very interesting article written by an Assyriologist about his um, Sadhaddun's love for the city of Haran and the temple of Sin. Um, the god uh, that is referred to, the moon, uh, with the moon symbol often referred to as the lamp in the heavens. Uh, his symbol is the lamp in the heavens because he sees through darkness. So Assyria is in chaos. Uh, he leads a small army, enters Nineveh from the west where um, he battles and drives out the murderers, but he is not able to um, arrest the main conspirators, which are his brothers, uh, most prominently Urdu Munisi. He orders all his enemies to be uh, killed uh, for treason. The leaders of the conspiracy uh, escape, and they escape to Urartu or in the mountains. They're not heard from again. No one knows, actually, if they really go into Urartu and are protected by people in Urartu. Uh, Urdu Munisi is thought to still have a chance at becoming a king, and this causes uh, Sarhaddun a great deal of consternation over many years. Sarhaddun eliminates any potential allies of his brother at home in case he tries to take power. Many officials throughout Assyria are suspected of having sympathy are replaced, and, uh, and oftentimes they are executed, unfortunately. So it is thought that a great number of people lost their lives during this time within the Assyrian leadership. And um, this caused a kind of a difficult situation, which although the Assyrian state continues to operate, is possibly going to affect it in the years to come. As a result of this very traumatic experience, Sarhaddun uh, has what one scholar describes as overwhelming distrust of people around him, particularly the male heirs around him. I mean, after all, he's been betrayed by his brothers who swore to hold up his kingship, but then turned and, and stabbed him in the back, as it were. He regularly tried to establish by means of oracle queries to the gods to find out if anyone is trying to hurt him. And he engages in a ritual of uh, assigning a person who is um, uh, an imposter king, quote unquote, to see if there's uh, any kind of evil omen coming his way. He does this, uh, and this is a, a tradition in Assyria, he does this three times, whereas most kings would do it only once because he's very worried about um, lasting as a king. Because he distrusted um, his male uh, relatives, many of his male relatives and people around him, he is 
thought to have been very close to the women of the palace. And at this time, we see his daughter, um, Shirua uh, Utirot, and uh, his mother, Nakia uh, Zakutu, as well as his wife, uh, take very prominent roles. Um, the power of his wife is uh, Ishara Hamad, is very well known in Assyria at this time. And this presents a very unique situation where these Assyrian women are becoming extremely powerful. Um, by the way, it's the father really of Saheddin that is known as kind of a, among some scholars as a feminist of sorts, meaning giving rights to women, giving um, uh, a lot of leverage to uh, his wife, especially his second wife, Nakia Zakutu, something that had not been done before. Not in a pattern uh, a way, anyway. So I had this daughter, uh, Sharua Itirat, uh, occupies a very prominent role. And in the future, she plays a, in her writing, she writes with a lot of confidence. Um, in the future, she is going to try to play a role to solve the conflict between Asher Banipal and Shana Shum Ukin, his brother, his older brother. <clears throat> and according to Karen Radner, this is without parallel in any, uh, for any Near Eastern woman of that time. So the Assyrians really uh, at the top uh, positions uh, gave kind of very prominent role to certain women of the palace that had not been seen before in uh, any of the Near Eastern civilizations. Now, as we said, Sarhaddun had a great deal of fear of assassination. He had a palace in, in uh, Nimrud constructed in a way that would give him a great deal of protection where there was Fort Shalmansar where the Assyrian military had been situated. Um, there was a uh, very uh, steep uh, uh, climb into this palace, a very narrow hallway, all really done um, in two similar places in both Nineveh and in uh, Nimrud. Uh, for the protection of the king, because he was very concerned. In addition to being very concerned and traumatized by the experience that he had with his older brothers in attempting to, uh, in, in murdering his, their father and attempting to unseat Sahedun, his, his physical condition became very poor. He was constantly sick with illnesses, mostly of a severe nature. For days, he withdrew to his sleeping quarters and refused food, drink, and most disturbingly, any human company. So it looks like Sahedun had depression. The death of his beloved wife in 673 uh, may have further damaged uh, his fragile, both psychological and physical health. Now, for the mighty king of Assyria, for the all-powerful king of the Assyrians, this illness was shocking to many people around him. Sarhaddun's counselors uh, witnessed his deterioration, and uh, they were very concerned about it. And oftentimes they would object uh, to him remaining um, in seclusion, uh, but there was nothing they could do. It is a testament to Assyria's sound administrative structure that the empire could take the king's continuing inability to act his part and keep going. In other words, the machinery of the Assyrian state was there. So even if the king was not able to play the role of a king, the almighty Assyrian king, the Assyrian state still continued on. So there must have been very um, uh, sophisticated and sufficient organization in the empire to be able to do that. Modern day uh, man may well be able to muster considerable sympathy for Sarheddun, according to Karen Radner, um, whose symptoms were indeed rather alarming. As we know from correspondence left by royal physicians and exorcists, his days were governed by spells of fever and dizziness, violent fits of vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and pa painful earaches. Depressions and fear of impending death were a constant in his life. In addition, his physical Appearance was affected by the marks of a permanent skin rash that covered large parts of his body and especially his face. In one letter, the king's personal physician, certainly a medical profession at the very top of his lead, was forced to confess his ultimate inability to help the king. My lord, 
The king keeps telling me, why do you not identify the nature of my disease and find a cure? As I told the king already in person, his symptoms cannot be classified. You know, the old uh, or the modern Assyrian expression, Dardo litlun dormana, or Dardo litlun dormana, his, his suffering has no cure. It was the situation that King Sarhaddin found himself in. Still, and, and think about this in terms of your own experience in life, despite the difficulties you may have in life, how a person can rise with all of the physical and the psychological ailments that one has, King, Sa King uh, Sarhaddin still rises above and he continues to rule as a great king. He proved himself a successful regent who after a chaotic start was able to consolidate his kingship and rule and prevent territorial losses and also bring back uh, further territories. Treacherous vassals, who had thought that Assyria was weakened and tried to benefit from this weakness, had to come to the painful realization that Sarhaddin fully controlled his governors and his army and was able to take revenge for treason in the same way that his predecessors had done. In other words, the Assyrian Empire was here to stay. Vassal kingdoms of Sidon and Shubria, which is near the um, uh, Lake Van in Turkey, were conquered, Sidon, of course, is in Lebanon, and turned into Assyrian provinces. Again, you understand the difference between vassal kingdoms and Assyrian provinces. The uh, structure is different. One is kind of ruling autonomously. The other is ruled by an Assyrian governor. A province is ruled by an Assyrian governor. And the Assyrians were very flexible in which setup they were able to have for political security and financial gain. In 674, in a skillful maneuver, Sarhaddin initiated a peace treaty with Elam, which is going to be problematic in the future, but the Assyrians were trying as much as they can to have um, a balanced approach to keeping power, which included using diplomacy, which was the preferred um, um, method. And then at times, if diplomacy wasn't working, um, they would pursue war. So diplomacy by other means, as uh, Plotz would say. Securing um, uh, this, this left, uh, um, this situation with Elam, um, which was a, a longstanding rival, left um, Assyria to tend to other uh, issues, which was most prominently Egypt's role in the Levant. Now we have a situation where the great powers are coming closer together. But Sarhaddun defeats other people who are also coming into the north, uh, the Sumerians, who are a, a, an Iranian-type uh, people like the Medes, are invading in the north, causing havoc in the north, and uh, Sarhaddun had met them head-on in battle uh, at Silsia, and he defeated them and killed their king, Tushpa, with his own sword. So Sarhaddun uses diplomacy in certain areas in Elam. He is waging war against um, uh, the uh, um, uh, Sumerians, but using peace in the south. Where necessary, he has kind of a double approach. He has a, a, a multi-faceted approach in southern Mesopotamia, for example, with the cities, or Sipa, Babylon, Ur, and, and other cities, Larsa, for example, he takes a more diplomatic course with the rebels um, of the Chaldean tribes. He takes a more harsh approach. So when he is uh, in a struggle with his brothers, we have a Chaldean tribal leader who tries to take advantage and attacks the Assyrian governor at Ur. So Haddon sends troops against the leader, forcing him to flee north, eastward into Elam, into Iranian territory. But because there is a treaty and there are good relations. The Elamites um, king summarily executes the rebel to have good relations with um, Sarhaddun. Sarhaddun, remember, came after his father who devastated the city of Babylon um, because 
he had uh, experienced several strikes, as it were, the death of his son, the continued rebellion by various tribes moving into Babylon. He had had enough. And so Sahedun uh, now engages in the reconstruction of the city. He records uh, in the first year of his reign, he begins reconstruction of the city of Babylon, references made to Sennacherib's destruction of the rebellious city a few years before. But he is very careful to say that the gods were angry at Babylon and caused the problem that Babylon had because they did not follow the uh, dictates of the gods, namely Marduk. Description of how Sarhaddon rebuilt the great shrines and brought back the dispersed population of Babylon, providing clothes, land, and guarantees of freedom in return for this demonstration of his excellence as a king. Sarhaddon prays for long life and prosperity. And he says, he tells us, it was me, Sarhaddon, whom they chose to restore everything to its rightful place, to calm their anger, to assuage their wrath. You, Marduk, entrusted the protection of the land of Ashur to me. The gods of Babylon, meanwhile, told me to rebuild their shrines and renew the proper religious observance of their palace, Esigil. I called up all my workmen and conscripted all of the people of Somer and Ekad, or Babylonia. I set them to work digging up the ground and carrying the earth baskets, or carrying the earth away in baskets. And so Babylon, having been destroyed by his father, or greatly damaged, or probably not all destroyed, and having some of its people exiled, is uh, brought back again to its uh, glory. The big power play here is between Assyria and Egypt. And uh, Egypt's relationship with Assyria has gone through uh, since the time of Ashur Ubalit the I, uh, possibly even before different types of uh, largely peaceful relations. It's a chess game, especially in the Levant between Egypt and Syria. You have one group, one power pushing, another one pulling, and then one power pulling, and another one pushing, back and forth with the many vassal states and provinces in this region between um, Assyria and Egypt. Egypt had sent tribute in the form of exotic animals being offered to Shalmansar a couple of hundred years before uh, Sarhaddun came to power. And here we see from uh, Shalmansar's um, uh, black obelisk, uh, you know, monkeys and uh, elephants being sent as gifts to the Assyrian uh, king, Shalmansar III. But Sarhaddun has a conflict with Egypt. And the conflict really begins with his father, with the coming of a new, what we call the black pharaohs or the Nubian pharaohs coming to power in Egypt during this time um, in the eighth century BC and presenting a challenge to the Assyrians. Now the whole story of King Sennacherib and uh, his, um, his surrounding of the city of Jerusalem and, and what is mentioned in the Bible really has to do more with Egypt rather than with the kingdom of Judah. What do I mean? There is evidence, archeological evidence that King Sennacherib fought the Egyptians outside of Jerusalem. And then after that, he goes back to Nineveh. So how that battle went exactly, no one knows. Uh, the Assyrians claimed victory, but the Egyptians went back. So they both suffered um, losses, and, uh, but the Assyrians are going to be back. So Heddun's journey to Egypt begins um, with his first stop in Tyre, in Lebanon. I mobilized the abundant troops of Assyria in Nisanu, or Nisan, the first month, first month of the year, of course. I departed from my city, Asha. I traversed the rivers in Tigris and Euphrates during their period of flood. Of course, Nisan is the month where uh, the snows melt in the mountains and the rivers are raging. Like a wild bull, I crossed steep mountains in the course of my campaign, I erected entrenchments against Ba'lu or Baal, king of Tyre, who had trusted in Tarqu, Taharqa, king of Kush and his ally. Remember the Kush um, uh, monarchy had taken over Egypt at this time. 
shed the yoke of my Lord Ashur and reacted to me in insolence. And I cut the inhabitants of Tyre off from bread and water than lightly. So Tyre surrenders, uh, Baal uh, comes uh, and kneels to Sahedan. And this is the trek that the Assyrian army had taken, and eventually they're going to wind up in Egypt. Now, it is said that the first attempt, although we don't know for sure, but the Assyrians do not mention it, and this could be possibly because there were losses suffered by both sides, the first attempt at the conquest of Egypt does not go so well. It's around the year 7 or 674, but then the second event goes very well. And, um, and King uh, of Baal uh, is brought to, he is kneeling here in the uh, stele of Sarheddun, which is in a city in uh, Turkey today. Um, it's housed in Turkey. And there were many of these uh, types of stele set up. And uh, the king of Tyre bowed down and implored me as his lord. He kissed my feet and was ordered to pay heavy tribute and to send his daughters with dowries. As for Hazael, king of Arabia, the splendor of my majesty overwhelmed him. And with gold, silver, and precious stones, he came into my presence, meaning he came to see me and also kissed my feet. Into Arabia, Sarhaddin sent bowmen mounted on horseback and brought the villages of the desert under his yoke. Then he conquered also Sidon. So the entire coast where there were rebellions uh, being stirred largely by Egypt, uh, Sarhaddin manages to um, quell all of the rebellions and he brings everyone under the reign of the Assyrian Empire. When he goes to Haran, and this is from a letter that was sent after the death of Sarhaddin. In Haran, the god Sin was enthroned on a wooden column, two crowns on his head, and standing in front of him was the god Musku. Sarhaddin entered and placed the crowns onto his head, and the following was proclaimed. You shall go forth and conquer the world. And he went and conquered Egypt. And this is a praise of uh, also the relationship that Sarhaddin had with this very important religious center, the Temple of Sin, which, by the way, we're going to discuss this, this practice of, of worshiping um, the god Sin goes well into Christian times, and we're going to uh, refer to this in later classes. So Haddon crosses Sinai and into Egypt, and he takes Memphis. From Egypt, I mobilized my encampment and set out 30 miles of land um, the bank of the Brook of Egypt, which is an area where um, uh, is in the Sinai, kind of almost in the middle of the Sinai area. Where there is no river, I let the troops drink buckets of water down from wells with ropes and chains. According to the command of my Lord Ashok, an idea came to my mind and I conceived the following. I mobilized the camels of all the kings of Arabia and loaded them with water skins and water containers. So the, the, the trek to Egypt, of course, is a very long trek here. And, but the Assyrians find a way to um, take camels largely instead of horses because the camel obviously can survive in desert uh, temperatures much easier than horses. Um, 20 miles of land and tells a story of what he sees here. A march through mighty sand dunes. Four miles of land I traveled over stones. Four miles of land, a journey of two days. <clears throat> I stepped repeatedly on two-headed snakes, whose touch is deadly, but continued. Four miles of a land, journey of two days, yellow snakes spreading wings, uh, kind of a uh, blizzard in the desert. Four miles of land, a journey of two days, and some 16 miles of land, a journey of eight days on march. So it's a long march. The great Lord Marduk came to my rescue. He revived my troops. Obviously, the Assyrian troops are very, very tired uh, at this time, being in the desert, crossing the desert. You can imagine with their armor and all they had to carry. 27 days of the border of Egypt, I set up a night camp. And there's the brook of Egypt uh, in the Sinai, and the Assyrians are on their way to Memphis, which is the city just below the delta of the Nile. Now, what happens is when the Assyrians take Memphis, 
Maharka, who is the Nubian king who had conquered Egypt up until this time, um, escapes to the south of, of uh, uh, Egypt, goes into Nubia. Um, Sarhedim captures and destroys Memphis, seats himself in the royal throne of Taharqa, who flees, but he captures his children and he captures his uh, crown prince. He eventually, Taharqa tries to resist again, but uh, he fails. Um, Nico I is appointed as pharaoh. Sarhedim becomes the king of Egypt and Kush, or Nubia. And he tells us that his queen, his harem, his prince, his heir, and the rest of his sons and daughters, his property and his goods, his horses, his cattle, his sheep, in the countless numbers I carried off to Assyria, the root of Cush I tore up out of Egypt. Now, this happens later during the son of Sarhaddun's, um, the, the king who takes over after Sarhaddun, and that they are forced, the Assyrians, to come down again and pursue Taharqa all the way to Thebes and down perhaps even further. Uh, and he disappears into the land of Nubia. And this is the end of the rule of Cush uh, in Egypt. The victory stele of Sarhaddun is a very unique victory stele um, among Assyrian kings, and I'll tell you why. Um, it has to the sides of it in addition in, to an image of Sarhaddin obtaining the submission of the son of the pharaoh who leans here, uh, kneeling um, before King Sarhaddin, and the king of Baal who is uh, kneeling next to him uh, or standing next to him. There are images of Asher Bani Paul, the crown prince, and also of Shamashum Ukin, uh, the brother of Asher Bani Paul. Remember the trauma that Sarhaddun underwent with his own brothers. And so he is very concerned about what's going to happen between his sons. The one who is very talented, Ashur Bani Paul, uh, and the one who is the oldest, uh, Shamashum Ukin. Um, Egyptian conspirators, again, this is a... Um, um, kind of a statement of Assyrian uh, preference for diplomacy. It's often thought that Assyrians uh, did not use diplomacy. They were just ruthless and cruel. And of course, this is not the case as shown repeatedly in various records. Over and over again, we see this. The uh, one who rebels against Assyria, Nico I, is pardoned. He is brought to Assyria, but he is allowed to go back to Egypt again and rule. There's a very important document that has shaped the way um, we understand, I would say, the world because it's entered the Bible stylistically, and that is the Edde, or the Momita, towards uh, Sarhaddin. Because of his failing health, Sarhaddin saw himself permanently in death's clutches. This alone made it necessary to provide for his succession. He's thinking about what's going to happen to Assyria. Who would be king after him? There were a great many possibilities. He had 18 children, as we said, but some of them suffered, like their father, from various illnesses. In 672, Sarhaddin proclaimed uh, detailed instructions for the succession of two his, of his sons, one who ruled in Syria and one in the south, one who ruled from Nineveh, who was the greater king, Ashurbanipal, and then his older brother, who ruled, ruled from Babylon. You shall protect Ashurbanipal. This is the Edde. It's written in larger size. There were many copies made of this tablet, which is very large. It's made kind of easy to read. It has seals on it, three seals, as we'll see in detail what these seals mean. A treaty which Sarhaddun, Ashur Achidin, king of Assyria, has established with you, you the Assyrian, and you the leaders before the great gods of heaven and earth regarding Ashur Bani Akli or Ashur Bani Pal great crown prince ascendant, son of Ashur Achidin, or Sarhaddun, king of Assyria, whom he has named and appointed to ascendant crown prince. When Ashur Achidin, or Sarhaddun, king of Assyria, has passed away, when he has died, you shall seat Ashur Banipal, great crown prince ascendant, on the throne of kingship. He shall assume kingship and lordship of Assyria over you. 
whether in open field or in the city, you shall protect him. For his sake, you shall fall and even die. You shall speak with him in truthfulness of heart. You shall advise him wholeheartedly with good advice. You shall prepare a smooth path for his feet. Thou shalt not rebel against him, nor seat any of his brothers. Now we get into a situation where there's concern about who exactly is going to rule and how. Whether older or younger, on the throne of Assyria in his stead. So Asher Bani Paul is first. Thou shalt not change or alter the word of Sarhaddon, king of Assyria. Thou shalt obey Asher Bani Paul, great crown prince ascendant, whom Sarhaddon, king of Assyria, your lord, has presented to you. He shall assume kingship and lordship of Assyria over you. So you shall protect Asher Bani Paul, the great crown prince ascendant, um, and who has been designated for you, and who you have established, or, or a treaty has been established between you and the gods. You shall not stray from his will, nor bring your hands to wickedness against his will, nor cause any acts of rebellion against him, nor rebel against his kingship of Assyria, nor let any of his brothers, whether older or younger, seize the throne of Assyria in his stead. Asher Manipal is first. Nor establish another king or lord over him, over you, nor swear loyalty to another king or crown prince. And there are three seals that are very important that are assigned to this tablet. The first is the ancient, very ancient seal of the kingdom of Ashur. The second one is the seal of Tikulti Ninurta, kneeling before the gods. And the third one is a more recent one of Sarhaddin, before Ishtar and Ashur. Despite the, the, uh, uh, despite the uh, loyalty oath and uh, as if Sarhaddin did not have enough problems, a new conspiracy has spread. So as if kind of like the way that he's thinking, the way that he, he you know, the, the, the old saying, like if you have negative thoughts, if you have fears, then maybe some of these things come true. So there's a new prophecy that rises in the land, and this comes from, again, Haran, possibly from the city where uh, Sarhaddun had been hidden when his brothers had uh, committed the conspiracy against their father and against Sarhaddun. So this is from a woman who falls into ecstasy uttering a message, a divine message. Quote, this is the word of the god Nuskum. Kingship belongs to Sasi, this name. I shall destroy the name and seed of Sennacherib. And this was the prophecy. This man who bore a rather common name that may well have been an abbreviation, and who entertained a household at Haran at the time, is extremely likely to have been part of the royal family, as he could not have been considered a descend um, uh, for kingship at the time. But he is not supposed to be a descendant of Sennacherib. So many scholars think that he, he was a descendant of King Sargon II, but not necessarily of Sennacherib. It seems that loyalty oaths were taken to this person, Sasi, as if he was already a king, just like the case of Urdu Mulisi, whose supporters had taken an oath of rebellion against Sennacherib. And this woman who had uttered prophetess, I guess one could say, who had uttered this uh, prophecy, had also uh, given an oath to Sasi. Sarhaddun, in the beginning, gathers a lot of intelligence. He engages in the practice of the imposter king. In other words, he assigns someone to take his, his role for 100 days. He disappears for 100 days. Um, and uh, this is supposed to kind of bring to fore all the evil. And he is able to see what is going to happen, prophecy. As soon as the 100 days are over, he moves very quickly and suppresses this revolt immediately. And in the words of Karen Rader, using maximum force, he was successful. In contrast to his father, he did not have to pay with his life. But Karen Radner makes a, a very interesting observation. The available chronicle texts offer but a brief remark for the year 670. Quote, 
the king killed many of his magnates in Assyria with the sword. So there was a, a, a massacre of sorts here. This Stoic statement is brutal enough in itself, but it can only be, it can only uh, um, insufficiently convey that this massacre, the second one that Sarhaddin had ordered among his own people within a decade, uh, really must have meant for the country. If one considers the well-oiled machinery of Assyria's administration, and it did have that as the backbone of the empire, it becomes apparent that killing off a large part of the top officials would cause far more and also more permanent harm to the state than the murder of a king, one particular king. Just how much the empire structure was damaged is also shown by the highly unusual fact that in the months for the new year, no official name was chosen to provide um, the, the year's name because every year had a name of an official. A situation which was extremely rare and attested to the long course of in, in the long course of Assyrian history, and usually marks a time of inner turbulence. Now, Sarhaddin's legacy is, you know, to be weighed in ways, and I'll leave this for you to think about. Well, what was he doing? You know, would it have been better to kind of let people take the kingdom or is it better to protect it? I'm sure he had a tough time in making uh, the decisions that he made. I'm sure it wasn't very easy for him to make uh, the decisions that he made at the time by killing off a large number of people. Uh, this king, though, had suffered from various psychological illnesses and trauma. So we, we got to remember that he also had kept the empire intact and had recovered various territories that were about to be lost. In fact, he enlarged the empire to, um, to a size that it had never been before. Now, after Sarhaddin leaves Egypt, a rebellion breaks out by Tahak, Taharqa, and Sarhaddin initiates a military campaign to Egypt in 669. But the Assyrian king does not make it, and he dies en route in the city of Haran, where the prophecy was given. It was up to his son and heir, Ashur Manipal, to reconquer Egypt in 667. Memphis, of course, was reconquered. Tahapa fled southward, and the Assyrian vassals in Egypt were reappointed. 